Morning pigs. I got some food scraps for you. And soybean meal, their favorite. The two gilts here by the shop are getting big and pushy and it's getting harder for me to get in and out of this gate because they know I'm coming in with something that they want. And fortunately, that does tend to make them follow me over to the little dish that I feed them in, but I think I might need to get some sort of feeder set up like right here along the fence so I could just dump it in without having to go in the pen with them. Watch it, watch it. Time to wake up. Right now our little peach trees are producing far more than we can eat. So the pigs end up getting a lot of peaches this time of year. We've got three peach trees in the in our little home orchard here and this one has actually produced really well this year but all the peaches are small they're like golf ball size or a little bit bigger. The other two peach trees up here are not nearly as loaded as that first one I showed you but these are all like baseball size peaches and you know if you're going to take the time to peel it and cut it up I'd rather do it on one of these bigger ones. Cattle are already up here looking for shade. That's not a good sign. That means it's probably gonna be hot today. I kinda wanna nose around out here and check out two things. One, being fly load, uh, because I'm trying a new mixture in the cow sprayer that I'll tell you about in a minute. And then the other is if I can spot that hoof rot calf that I treated a few days ago, I wanna try to see how she's doing. I haven't really looked at her in the last couple of days because I wanted to give that medicine some time to work. And, you know, I figured a few days later, I'll really be able to see a difference. What I have noticed though, is that I don't catch her laying by herself. She stays with the herd. So at the very least, she's feeling good enough to get up and move around and follow everybody. But I suspect she's probably still limping a little bit. A little bit. What I'm seeing mostly on these cows are face flies, and even they are not that bad. But the horn flies, I feel like, are a lot less than they usually are. And if you just kind of stand back and look at the herd from a distance, you see very little tail swishing, which would be them trying to swat at flies. I'm not saying you don't see any, but you don't see much. The other day, the cow sprayer ran out of spray, and I didn't have more permethrin to mix up to spray on the cows, and I got to thinking, and a while ago, somebody had told me that just spraying soapy water on wasps would kill them, Dawn dish soap. And that turned out to be true. I've tried it a couple times and it works pretty good. So I started thinking, well, if Dawn dish soap will kill wasps, surely it would kill a fly as well because I don't think a fly is nearly as hardy as a wasp is. So what I did is I put 23 gallons of water in the spray tank, one gallon of Dawn dish soap and a gallon of vinegar for good measure. And I think that it's working. If you look here, you can see there's a bunch of dead flies on the ground and the cow sprayer itself is covered in dead flies. Oh, hear that? <laughs> I don't know if I mentioned it, but this tank has an automatic agitator that goes off every 30 minutes and mixes that solution up. So you're not gonna have any risk of like what you put in there separating out. It's gonna stay mixed up really nice like that. And this cow here, if you've noticed her standing in the background, that's number 65. This is actually Bismarck's mother. We bought her from Split Creek Ranch and she was the recipient cow that carried Bismarck and gave birth to him. She does not like this sprayer at all. She walks through here 
only when she really needs to get some water. The rest of these cattle have become pretty broke to it and they don't even barely pause as they walk through it anymore. She is the exception. She's still resisting this thing. And you can tell by how many more flies are on her compared to the other cows. A picture is worth a thousand words. You can see how many flies are on her. And I know that she travels through this thing maybe not even once a day. I think she goes in, gets her fill of water, and then when she comes back out, she just hangs out here as long as she can. She just, she doesn't like this thing, but I think she'll come around to it. And the fly load on her, I mean, that's, uh, that's not in my mind. That's, you can really see the difference. Truth be told, I don't think the Dawn dish soap and vinegar works as good as permethrin. I'm sure the permethrin kills a lot better. But what I like about using that spray in the sprayer is that, I mean, I, if that gets on my hands, if it gets on me, if it gets on their face, or like, let's say you spray some and it gets on the cow's udder, then the calf comes up and nurses. I don't really worry about them ingesting that or me bringing that home into my house. I mean, I could, I could wash my hands with the mixture that I'm spraying these flies with. And it may not work as good as permethrin, but it's, it's working pretty good. The thing about using dish soap as a fly spray is that you're not gonna get a residual kill like you would from permethrin or some sort of chemical like that. I think the only mode of action here is a contact kill. So it's whenever they walk through the sprayer and they actually are getting spray on that fly is what's gonna kill it. So in like a hand sprayer or a back rubber application, I, I don't think this is gonna work, but the beauty of the cow sprayer is these cows are probably walking in and out of this corral maybe three, four times a day. So they're getting three or four applications and each time they walk through and get an application, we're killing a little bit more, killing a little bit more. So we're not really getting that like huge instant kill like you might get with permethrin, but because the sprayer applies it so frequently, that's why we're seeing the results. So watching the cows just now, what I'm seeing is that they've become so used to the sprayer that now they're walking really slowly through it and they're not getting a full application. I moved the trip arms up a little bit to get it to start spraying sooner. And now it's not making it all the way to their back. So there is a solution for this. If I can walk through here without triggering it. Right now I've got it set to only spray for one second. I'm just gonna turn it up to two seconds. So now when they walk through there slowly, they'll get a full two seconds of spray, which should go from shoulder to tail. The reason that it's just like a momentary switch like that is because you could potentially get a cow just standing in there with the arms tripped and I mean it could just spray for like 30 seconds which you wouldn't want because that'd be a huge waste of your chemical. I also had some people ask about uh, moving the arms and what about when the cows walk through it the other way isn't it going to be messed up? Well it only works going one way. So they're only getting spray when they exit the corral. When they enter the corral, nothing happens. My friends. And while we're out here getting updated on stuff, uh, several people have asked about our late calf that we got from our, what should have been not bred heifer. And you can see, this is her right here, this little tiny calf. She's doing fine, she's little, excuse us. The calf is doing just fine. She is small, but she's always gonna be small. I mean, she was, gosh. 30 pounds, 40 pounds when she was born, she was so tiny. And you gotta remember, since her mother is so young, she's not milking very heavy, so I don't really expect this calf to do much of anything as far as growth goes, but she is alive, and that's the main thing. How you feeling? I know I'm on the wrong side to film you. Well, there you go. The hoof rot calf has still got a detectable limp. I mean, I can see it, but it's nowhere near as bad as it was a few days ago. 
and I, I think she's moving the right way. Keep watching her, of course, but so far things are looking good. I can tell that that foot is still a little bit swollen and she's definitely still favoring it, which I, I would expect, honestly. I mean, I only treated her three or four days ago, so I wouldn't expect a complete turnaround yet, but she's looking better. And um, if she is still limping at all before I send them down to the backfield, I might hit her with copper tox one more time. I don't think I'll do a second round of antibiotics, but I might still do the hoof treatment just for good measure. We're out of grease, of course. There's few jobs that are as messy as changing grease tubes, but it's still easier than changing bearings. Yep. What really gets me about this mower is that you have to take these two nuts off to open this shield. Seems like they could have easily put a pin or some sort of a latch here so that you didn't actually need tools to disassemble the guard in order to grease it. And I guess in the big picture, it's really not that big of a deal. I mean, it is only two nuts. But it's kind of like paying for shipping. I just feel like we've reached a point in life where we just shouldn't have to do that anymore. Yeah, we're full. We're out here in the hay field now, and as you can see, I've got a ton of drought tolerant weeds coming up and some volunteer growth from this year's hay crop. Um, I'm actually thinking that because I've got all these triticale seed heads out here and I'm going through and mowing them down, I'll probably have a really good stand of triticale next year. Essentially what I'm doing right now is seeding this hay field. With the dense weed growth out here, trying to work this ground up would not be a very good idea right now. So I gotta come through and mow all this down, chop it up into fine pieces, and then I'll be able to come through with the chisel and the disc after that, and it should be able to work this down pretty good. I got this half done yesterday. It looks pretty good, but there wasn't nearly the weed pressure out here as there is on this half. So this might take a little bit longer, but hey, it's gotta be done. Things are looking a lot better out here, and when I do come to work this ground up, this will actually be possible now. When you have that tall of weeds out here and you try to run a disc through it, it just doesn't work. It really kind of blows my mind how green and tall some of these weeds can get with essentially no water. I mean, we're going two, two to three months now with no rain, and these plants are able to grow that much. It's just amazing to me. And it got me thinking about a while back, one of you guys asked me why I don't do dry land alfalfa out here. And I honestly had never heard of dry land alfalfa. And the more I'm thinking about it and kind of doing my own research about it, 
the more interested I am in trying that. So if whoever left me that comment or anyone watching, if you know anything about dryland alfalfa, please email me because I am trying to figure out if it would be a good fit for me in this environment. It's hot, let's go do something else. I'm out here at the steer pasture and I totally forgot to bring my normal cameras with me. So I'll be filming everything over here on the iPhone. Come on boys. What are we doing? Let's go. Where are we going here? Really? We gotta stop and take a break in the shade? Oh, look at that, the gate's open. What do you know? All right, guys, we'll see you in a few days. got all my irrigation valves set up here in the middle field so now I just got to go set the timer on the pump and we can call it a day. Thanks for hanging out with me today guys and I hope I'll see you again on Farmer Tyler Ranch.